superintendent finalist just announced in Doug Co, including the woman the board reached out to before they fired the last guy. Why the trust that this COVID letdown is the last one we need to worry about? A contempt citation for the elected official who got a kick out of getting arrested. The possibility that Colorado will welcome refugees from Texas. We may be Coloradans, but we are Americans first, and there's nothing more patriotic than being there for other Americans in their time of need. And in one of Colorado's coldest places, the heating assistance funds have run out for the winter. We're going to fix that together, because this is next. Colorado's third largest school district is a key step closer to picking a new leader tonight. Doug Coe School Board just unveiled two superintendent finalists including the conservative majority's presumed favorite, the woman that they reached out to about the job before they fired the last superintendent. Aaron Kane got a heads up from the board before things went sideways with former superintendent Corey Wise. She's the former interim superintendent in the district, currently leads the charter school American Academy. She's advocated for charter schools to be able to arm teachers and opt out of equity and communicable disease policies. The second finalist, Danny Windsor, is executive director of schools for the Parker region of the district. He also oversees the district's choice programming department, which helps parents get into charter schools, magnet schools, and homeschooling. He's been with Dugco Schools for 13 years. Tonight, the progressive board minority tried to add on a third finalist, got voted down. They also tried to make Windsor the sole finalist to avoid Kane. They were voted down on that as well. The board majority is going to be paying two superintendents at once, but that was their choice. It's a result of a payout for firing the prior superintendent without cause under his contract. So you can forgive people for being skeptical that now we should let our guard down on COVID and just embrace this endemic stage because we've been told to let down before and the virus surged back into our lives. Whether to think this time is truly different, that was the topic of conversation today between our Anusha Roy and one of our go-to experts throughout the pandemic, CU Health Infectious Disease Specialist, Dr. Michelle Barron. Health leaders, state leaders, city leaders are now saying that they're starting to treat COVID as an endemic disease. Are we really at the point where we can say that comfortably? We can actually. If you look at the overall transmission rates, they've plummeted. Hospitalizations have gone down, um, and the, obviously the new number of cases that are positive, and those are the two measures that I think we've all been waiting for. The other thing is that they recently published a uh, report looking at you know, how many people are immune to Omicron in the state of Colorado, and it's upwards of 90%. It, it feels a little bit like deja vu, right? We, we watched case numbers go down, we watched hospitalizations go down, and we all kind of breathe this sigh of relief, and then COVID comes back with a vengeance. So what's to say that this is different, or could that still happen? There's no doubt that we could potentially have another surge come back, and obviously that's something that we're thinking about, and thinking about how we need to prepare for that. However, the big difference is the level of immunity. If you look back a year ago, we had rolled out vaccines, but we were still obviously very active in that process. Boosters were still not even a thing yet, if you think again about that, in terms of the level of protection that we thought we would need. And so I think that's one of the big differences is the level of immunity that we managed to get either through vaccination or through infection with Omicron. Early on in the pandemic, even referring to flu and COVID in the same conversation was a no-go. So why is it okay to have that conversation now? The big difference is what we know now. We think most people now are fully aware of COVID and what it can do. And so I think that comparison to the flu isn't as bad now, although the flu still causes issues. So it, I think, again, it's our comfort level with it is that we know the flu comes. It's not novel to us. Uh, we know what to expect from it. So I think that's the big difference. So Dr. Barron is saying that it's really important to recognize that people are still going to fall sick with COVID, but the goal is to prevent them from getting so sick that they end up in the hospital or they die because of this. And to be clear about that goal earlier, she said could have been really useful for people to kind of figure out what they were trying to work towards. And the fact that health experts are now talking about the flu and COVID in the same conversation is a sign of getting closer to being able to just live with the virus. And while we are in a good spot, obviously this is a global pandemic. Yeah. Right, and we've watched a lot of the variants come in from other countries. She said, though, that barring anything completely new that circumnavigates anything that we've had so far, she goes, we wouldn't really be starting from scratch. We might see some of those COVID precautions and rules come back, but we would be starting off in a much stronger position. 
you know, I think so many of us were just so ready to be done with masks that like as soon as somebody's as, as soon as like a, a respected doctor was like yeah you can be done with this you're just like fool I'm done <laughs> it's, but it, it, like all of this stuff is not that simple yeah so she was Dr. Barron was talking about this in hindsight right about how it was almost too simple the way COVID was explained to people and it was this all or nothing approach yes mass no mass yes vaccine no vaccine that gray area the nuances of the pandemic yeah. weren't really explained to folks and uh, they could have probably handled it and it's that gray area that we're probably going to end up living in as COVID does this transition to becoming endemic where we are Anusha thank you so our positivity rates, the lowest it's been since July. 3.8% of COVID tests done in the state came back positive over the last seven days. This got us thinking today. One of these times is going to be the very last time that we ever show you these COVID graphs that were such a staple of our days together during the worst of the pandemic. And my view can't come soon enough. Hope we don't have to ever show it again. Hopefully there's not reason to cause enough concern that we have to dust them off once more. So I learned today that contempt has two levels. There is direct contempt, which is what most politicians have for me. And then there's indirect contempt, which is what Mesa County's Republican clerk, Tina Peters, was cited with today. The indirect contempt citation is for allegedly using an iPad to record a court hearing when a judge said not to, then lying to the court about it. When law enforcement went to seize the laptop at a bagel shop, Peters back kicked the blue and struggled with officers and that led to an obstruction charge. The judge who decided that Peter should be cited for indirect contempt, not as serious as direct contempt in the eyes of the court, that judge wrote that Peters could have just fessed up and apologized for the recording and avoided the whole mess. Peters is running for Colorado Secretary of State while she's simultaneously under local and federal investigation for the breach of her voting system security. The Russian oligarch who owns the steel mill down in Pueblo is giving up a much more famous asset as the world sanctions Russia's rich over the war in Ukraine. Roman Abramovich is putting the Chelsea Soccer Club up for sale, expected to sell for billions. He also owns Evraz, a multinational steel company, which owns Evraz North America, which owns the Evraz steel plant in Pueblo. Chieftain newspaper reports that the plant began in expansion last year with plans to employ about 300 Coloradans. Some state employees are questioning why their retirement money has been invested in Russia. Para announced last week it would be divesting millions of dollars from a Russian bank to comply with federal sanctions. We had a state employee and viewer reach out to us wondering why Para had that money overseas to begin with and whether there's any chance of getting it back into the fund now that the U.S. has frozen Russian assets. We took the question to Dave Young, who sits on Paris board as the Colorado State Treasurer. Well, we have a $62 billion uh, diverse global portfolio, and the goal is to have a sustainable benefit for our members. But we want to be sure that the benefit is there for people when they retire. So when we invest, we make sure that we uh, diversify the portfolio. We spread out our investments so that if one small piece of it uh, isn't doing so well, there are other parts that can do better. Treasurer Young says the $8 million invested in Russian assets is really just a tiny fraction of what they hold. It's, it's one one hundredth of one percent of Paris entire portfolio. We did ask him how much business Colorado's pension fund is doing with other bad actors around the world. He said he didn't immediately have an answer to that. A number of you have asked if there is a nonprofit in Colorado currently assisting people in Ukraine. I'm doing some research on this. There are a few small efforts here. Nothing really that I feel comfortable recommending that next viewers flood with donations right now. I am open to suggestions of Colorado-based nonprofits that are helping in Ukraine. If you have ideas, send them with me. Uh, but until I find something that I'm confident enough that I think we should all be giving our money to, we're going to stay focused with Word of Thanks on local issues that we know that we can help immediately. That's why your Word of Thanks microgiving campaign this week will help people in the San Luis Valley heat their homes this winter. San Luis Valley, you know, is one of the most beautiful places in Colorado. It is also just cold, cold in the winter and poverty persists in much of that valley. Hundreds of families there rely on wood to heat their homes and others use propane. Both are very expensive this year. The nonprofit La Puente has heating assistance funds, but those funds have run out for the winter. 
The folks at the nonprofit say every day they get five to ten calls from people asking for help heating their homes throughout the winter. One woman even said that she had resorted to taking apart her fence for wood for her stove. Let's restock La Puente's heating assistance fund so that they can get back to those Coloradans on their waiting list to say that help has arrived for the rest of this winter. You scan the QR code on the screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491. We know that even $5 helps when enough people do it, so I'll match the first 50 donations of $5. That nonprofit, La Puente, can get your donations turned around into heating assistance for families fast, like 24 hours from when we give. So we'll be able to get help out to those families to heat their homes before the next cold snap arrives. Thank you. We've actually had quite a few calls from parents who live in Texas who have LGBTQ children asking us if, they, if we think that Colorado is a safe place for their children. Texans moving to Colorado is not new, but Texas's new plan to target transgender kids has parents looking to Colorado if they feel they need to leave. Need a reason to smile? You can grin in your new driver's license photo. We got a hold of the memo from the state saying the DMV won't tell you to smile, but they won't stop you. And Colorado takes steps toward creating its first new state holiday since the 1980s. That's next. Texas is targeting transgender kids, telling citizens to inform on families if they think the child's gone through transition care, like hormone therapy. It will be considered child abuse in Texas. As investigations into these families begin, our Julissa Irizarry explains Colorado is being seen as a potential safe haven. Walking into the center on Colfax is walking into a safe haven. We are here for you and thinking about you every day. For Joe Foster, Texas may be hundreds of miles away, but the latest orders from its governor couldn't hit closer to home. Disgusted. I felt completely disgusted that anyone in the right mind would think that laws like this would be helpful to anyone, anywhere. And it made me feel as though that maybe we are not as far ahead as we thought we were. Foster works at the Center on Colfax, the largest LGBTQ community center in the Rocky Mountain region. When word got out of Texas's latest order encouraging people to report parents of transgender children, the inquiries started to come in. We've actually had quite a few calls from parents who live in Texas who have LGBTQ children asking us if, they, if we think that Colorado is a safe place for their children. And we always emphatically say it certainly is. This week, a lawsuit was filed by a Texas family with a transgendered teen, asking a judge to block the state's investigation. The lawsuit states, quote, parents are scared to remain in Texas to send their children to school or to the doctor. Abbott believes minors receiving transitional care, such as hormone therapy or surgery, is child abuse under state law. And as the suit plays out in court, Foster and others will wait on Colfax with open arms for anyone looking for a safe haven. Because we may be Coloradans, but we are Americans first, and there's nothing more patriotic than being there for other Americans in their time of need. For next, I'm Jalisa Rosari. Within the last hour, a judge blocked the state of Texas from investigating one family, but did not take apart the directive as a whole. Denver's stretch of weather over the last nine days is so interesting, so unique, the National Weather Service couldn't tell us if it's happened before. We told you yesterday that smiles might make a comeback on Colorado's IDs. And then some insiders tipped us off to a smile pilot program quietly running right now. But you have to know that you can cheese it. That's next. Juneteenth, already a holiday at the federal level, is on its way to becoming a state holiday in Colorado. A bill to establish Juneteenth as a state holiday was introduced last month by Democratic members of the Black Caucus at the legislature. The day commemorates June 19, 1865, the day Union soldiers arrived in Galveston, Texas, to announce the end of the Civil War. They announced the emancipation of tens of thousands of enslaved black people. President Lincoln had issued the Emancipation Proclamation two and a half years earlier, but the news had not reached everywhere in the South. Juneteenth is not just a black American holiday. It is an American holiday, right? It's part of us. Uh, this is so important uh, to me. Uh, one is an African-American whose uh, ancestors were 
maybe some of those they got that word that day you know hey this is this is uh, this nightmare might be ending uh, but uh, also as an American that bill is expected to become law so Juneteenth would be officially marked in Colorado in June First new state holiday here since the first Martin Luther King Jr. Day in 1985. Cabrini Day is technically the most recent new holiday added to the calendar, but that was a swap out of an existing day, Columbus Day. Hey, you can smile, Colorado, as in do it in your driver's license photo. We confirmed today, after kind of talking about this a bit last night, there's a very quiet pilot program going on in the state's DMV offices now where they're finally allowing people to smile in their photos. You know the signs always tell you not to smile or whatever. DMV employees have been told that they're not supposed to tell people to smile, but they're not going to stop you if you choose to cheese it. The state says this trial will allow them to see if the new cheesy grins comply with the federal Real ID Act. Please smile. World needs more of it. We tied a record in Denver today with 74 degrees in March, a number that ties the record set back in 2009. 70s across the plains today could go warmer tomorrow in advance of a weekend storm that promises to bring some cold and snow starting on Friday night. We just have a few high clouds around the area tonight. We have a partly sunny day tomorrow, and then temperatures are right back above average again. Sunny and 73 tomorrow. The record is 76. We do have a cooling trend on Friday with increased and clouds. Rain and snow Friday night. Rain changing to snow Saturday. Snow showers Sunday. We're about two to four inches of snow by Monday when the storm moves out. And then sunshine in 40s for Tuesday and Wednesday. So, you know, last week D Denver was dealing with temperatures in the single digits. And now, now don't get comfortable. We know the second winter is on its way, but it feels like spring, right? Next viewer named Richard reached out after seeing the high temperature go up day after day after day and wondered if that might be some kind of a record. It's history. If you look at it, the daily temperature in Denver has increased each day for nine straight days. It's tough to do, right? Last Tuesday, eight degrees. Today, over 70. We asked the National Weather Service if this is a record of consecutive days of increases in the high temperature in Denver. They don't track that stat. <laughs> Meteorologist Chris Bianchi told us pretty uncommon to get that many days in a row where the high temperature is constantly increasing. We know, though, the cold is coming back, and it will be real cold in the San Luis Valley, where we're helping people to warm their homes for the winter. That and your feedback next. Each week, we search for a Word of Thanks microgiving project that can do immediate good work in Colorado. This week, it certainly will. The nonprofit that helps people in the San Luis Valley heat their homes with wood and propane through the winter has run out of their heating assistance funds. This is where you can come in. They're going to be able to turn those funds around in 24 hours, like before the next nasty cold arrives. If you scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491, I'll send you the link to join me in donating to La Puente. They have people calling every day asking for this assistance that they're no longer able to provide. We can step in and keep people warm for the remainder of the winter time. Lane Patterson writes in today about Tina Peters' citation in Mesa County for taping a court hearing, said, I didn't realize the public is not allowed to record a public court proceeding, only the media. That's interesting, Lane. We aren't allowed to just walk in and start rolling with the camera either. We have to get permission ahead of time for, from a judge. Judges have a lot of control over their courtrooms in Colorado. That's why that one in Mesa County is so ticked at the clerk. See you next time.